I first noticed it in spring last year. It must have been early April. I remember it well. It was a Saturday morning and I'd been to the corner shop to buy some food for a fried breakfast. For some reason, the shop was closed, so I decided to cut through a back street to the supermarket on the high road. It was a bright morning, but most of the street was still in shadow. And I found myself walking very close to the front walls and hedges in order to expose my face to the thin strip of warm sunlight that ran the length of the street. It was from here that I first saw it, its crest protruding over the roofs on the other side of the road. Surprised that I hadn't noticed it before, I wondered what it was and then forgot about it for several weeks. On April the 28th, I was late for an appointment. I had left my car lights on overnight and had to get a jump start from a passing van. Waiting to turn into Crownfield Road, I saw the tower through the gap between two blocks of flats. It seemed very close. As far as I could remember, the road I'd first spotted it from was nearly a mile away. I didn't have time to stop and work out the geography, but that evening I mentioned the tower to my next door neighbour as I wondered what it was used for. She said that she'd never seen it. A few weeks later, I went to visit a friend in Brixton Prison. I couldn't face driving through town in the rush hour, so I went by bus. It turned out to be a depressing meeting, as my friend had just heard that he'd been refused parole. Waiting outside for the bus home, I noticed a familiar structure inside the prison walls. I decided that it was some kind of water tower, but I was surprised that the design was the same as the one near my home. I was even more surprised when the bus stopped outside a factory and I noticed another identical building inside its grounds. I decided to take another look at the town in my house when I got back, but by the time I got there, it was dark. There was no moon and I couldn't see it over the rooftops. That night, I dreamt that I was imprisoned in the tower. My body was paralysed and only my eyes could move. At first, I thought that I was in complete darkness, but after a while, I noticed a greyish speck which remained in the same place when I moved my eyes. I realised that I was facing a flat black wall. I got the feeling that the room was in fact brightly lit, but I couldn't be sure. The tea's maid woke me up at 8.30 and I jumped out of bed and rushed across the room to switch it off. It had rained again during the night, but I drew open the curtains to discover that the morning sky was bright and clear. 
Shivering, I quickly put on my clothes and lit the fire. In the kitchen, I poured myself some fruit juice and made porridge. While waiting for it to cook, I did the washing up from the night before. tower was still on my mind, so after breakfast I went out to take a closer look at it and find out exactly what it was used for. When I got to the place where I first spotted it, it was nowhere to be seen. I walked back along the road, nearer to the front gardens. I even stood on the garden walls, but I still couldn't see anything over the rooftops. I walked the surrounding streets in case I'd taken the wrong turning, but there was still no sign of the tower. I went back to Crownfield Road and I couldn't see it from there either, so I went into the newsagents on the other side of the street and asked the man there what had happened to the tower. To my great relief, he told me it had been demolished the previous week. I bought the local paper and left the shop. It was starting to rain. I felt like getting out of London for a while. When I got home, I put some coal on the fire and started looking at the newspaper. It had got very wet and the pages were stuck together. I found it very difficult to read as the reverse type on the back of each page was almost as clear as the front. I laid the paper out in front of the fire and fell asleep in the armchair. I was woken up by the smell of burning and opened my eyes to see the rising smoke. I stamped out the flaming edge of the newspaper and my eyes focused on an article about the tower block demolition on Hackney Marshes the previous Sunday. I looked at the photograph of the leaning building and remembered my conversation with the news agent. I decided to go back to his shop. Our second conversation confirmed my suspicions. He had been talking about the tower block. When I described what the black tower looked like and pointed to where it had been, he just stared at me. I left the shop and leant against the lamppost outside, trying to control my breathing. I stared at the space where the black tower had been, trying to collect my thoughts. Two boys came by eating chips. I tried to ask them about the tower, but they ran away before I could finish my sentence. I stopped a woman pushing a pram full of groceries, but she ignored me completely. I started walking home. One of my shoelaces had come undone, and my shoe slipped uncomfortably against my heel as I walked. Outside St Mary's Church, I bent down to retie it, and looking up from the pavement again, I saw the tower behind the church roof. I panicked and started running, but when I got to the end of the street, the tower was there waiting for me. I turned the corner and saw it again. I kept running, taking different turnings, but whenever I looked up, I saw the tower. 
Whichever way I ran, it was always in front of me. home and collapsed onto the bed, but when I closed my eyes I saw the black walls of the tower staring back at me. They got darker and darker and the mass of the tower seemed to press against my forehead and force the back of my head into the pillow. I tried to keep my eyes open and stared at the sleeping Mexican who sat cross-legged on my ceiling. A huge sombrero was shielding his eyes from the blazing sun. Eventually the light faded and I fell into a deep dreamless sleep. I awoke feeling strangely calm. I cooked myself a fried breakfast and started to take stock of my situation. It seemed as though I would have to stay at home from now on as there was little doubt that I would encounter the tower again if I went out. I resigned myself to my fate. The days passed quickly at first, as I was spending most of my time working on this script. Writing had never come easily to me, and I found the pacing of dramatic fiction extremely challenging. In some ways, I appreciated my incarceration, as it forced me to keep working. After my food supply ran out, I lived on ice creams, which I bought from the van, which came down my street every afternoon. For a while, I ate mainly chalk ices, but I soon started to feel very unhealthy, so I went over to Strawberry Mivies for the vitamin C. I started to lose track of time and spent months sitting at my desk, staring out of the window, always downwards in case the familiar shape appeared over the rooftops. I took to wearing a cap with a large peak so that there was no danger of the tower appearing on the periphery of my vision. The arrival of the ice cream van became the high point of my day.
I don't know who called the ambulance, but I was glad when it arrived. At first, I thought it was the ice cream van and wondered why it was playing a different tune. When we arrived at the hospital, I was not surprised by the architecture. My recovery took several months, but the doctors were sympathetic and for the first time I was able to talk about the tower in detail without feeling that my audience would like to change the subject. As the weeks went by, my obsession diminished and by the time I was discharged, it had become clear to me that the tower had only existed in my mind. It was suggested that I should convalesce in the country, so I arranged to visit some friends in Shropshire. I felt rather apprehensive about socialising with people again after so long, but my friends were very understanding and left me to my own devices. The weather was fine, so I spent most of my time exploring the countryside. I didn't feel afraid when I saw the tower again. Instead, I could only laugh as it looked so absurd peering at me through the trees. I felt my old curiosity returning. I wondered how it had found me. I made my way through the woods and came upon the tower standing alone in a clearing. It was even bigger than I'd imagined, and close up it showed signs of age and decay, which had been indistinguishable at a distance. I opened the door and stepped into the darkness. I first noticed it a few weeks after his death. I remember the day well. It was the first time I went to visit his grave. It was a bright morning, so I did a bit of washing and messed about in the garden for a couple of hours before catching the train to the cemetery.
when I got there, it took me ages to find the place where he was buried. The cemetery was enormous, and the new grave was still marked with only a small wooden cross. I sat down beside it and wondered what epitaph would be carved in the stone. I closed my eyes and felt the warm sun on my face. When I opened them again, I found myself staring at the tower. Surprised I hadn't noticed it before, I wondered what it was, then forgot about it for a few weeks. <laughs>